Well, good morning or good afternoon, evening. I'm not sure where you might be viewing from, uh, but welcome to this session called Geo for All, blending OER, open data, and open software in GIS education. My name is David Abernathy, and I am a professor of global studies and geographic information systems at Warren Wilson College, which is a small liberal arts school uh, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina, up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And today I just wanted to talk a bit about my experience, uh, an ongoing experience in transitioning an introduction, uh, introductory GIS course from what I would consider predominantly closed course to one that's increasingly becoming open. And I'll talk about uh, steps I've taken along the way and next steps as we look towards continuing becoming more open in the future. So I'm going to frame this in just two main uh, bullet points here. First of all, talk a bit about why did we transition from proprietary software to almost exclusively open source software in our GIS courses at Warren Wilson College. That was our first step really in moving from closed to open. And then second, how can we then in turn leverage some additional layers of openness, open educational resources, open data and open pedagogy to further the educational mission of both our institution as well as the goals of the GEO for All initiative. And so first talking a bit about why transition to open source software when we already had access to, to the very popular uh, software system for geographic information systems, why, why transition? And I came up with this catchy acronym to, to encapsulate uh, why we did that. And this was also the sound that our IT department made when, when I asked to, um, if, if we could set up a full Linux lab, um, totally open source from top to bottom. And they, they let out a bit of a squeal. They said, we're a small department. We're trying to keep all of our labs sort of on the same system. And so ultimately we decided, okay, we'll run open source software, but we'll run it on the Windows operating system that was being incorporated in, in several labs on, on campus. But in addition to that, these E's, I think, um, uh, talk a bit about the reasons why we felt like we, we wanted to make this transition. The first of, first of those is expense. This is probably the low hanging fruit these days in higher education when institutions are looking to, to save money, uh, you know, tell, asking them, uh, that I wanted to switch to, to open source. Could we do that? And when I said, well, it's going to cost a lot less than what we're paying now, they said, sure, go for it. And so what we were doing at the time, this has changed over time uh, at institutions and it's different at larger institutions than our a small college like mine. But what we were paying for at the time was uh, uh, software for enough computers to fill our entire lab, uh, a single space. We also were paying for an additional software extension called Spatial Analyst that allows students and researchers to do um, land use analysis and some things that, that folks really wanted to be doing in, in our classes. So we had to do that. And we were paying on top of that a maintenance fee uh, each year just to kind of maintain the software upgrades. So again, it, not maybe a prohibitive expense, but enough of an expense that when, when told that we could remove that expense from the budget, folks were, were happy. And so now we have a, a lab that's running entirely on, on free software. And I point to Richard Stallman here uh, to remind us that, that free is not just the price, right? It's a sense of liberty. And so we'll come back to that point. But I, in addition to the expense, I, I think this liberty that it gives you uh, is something we should consider as well. I also think that transitioning to open source sort of fit the ethos of my particular college, uh, at least, um, and maybe others. It, we, we are, like I said, a small college in the mountains. We tend to have, we have a work program. We're one of eight work colleges in the country. So all students work in addition to going to school. Uh, and we have, a, as we can see here, we have a blacksmith shop. We have a fine uh, arts, uh, uh, excuse me, fi fiber arts crew. Um, we have a, a working garden, a working forest, working farm. So our students are used to making. They have that maker mentality, I like to say. And I think open source software is not that different. Our students like peeking under the hood. They like this idea of something built by community rather than by corporation. And so I feel like open source software really fit alongside the, the mission of my institution. The third E related to that is, is education. Um, there are a lot of folks who 
have have talked about, and here I come back to Richard Stallman about the sort of social implications of using open source software. And here another another quote by Stallman talks about we should use we should consider open software the same way we do uh, conservation and voting and and the sort of citizens' um, social mission. Indeed, if you look at some research in the past. Uh, or this particular editorial, for example, in Nature, that if you you know if you believe in the scientific method, if you believe in uh, looking at how people came to their results, not just the results they achieved, then you need to look under the hood. And arguably, uh, proprietary software kind of creates a black box, and you can't fully see how experiments were conducted. But if you use open software, you can see uh, exactly what was done. And I think sort of the, the impetus for me starting to make the, the transition was thanks to a lot of hard work being done at the OSGEO Foundation, uh, their Geo for All initiative in particular, really pushing in education the teaching of geographic information systems with open source tools. And that really got me to think about the, the, making this transition. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it here. Also, ease of use. Some of you have likely used open source software. If you go back a couple of decades, it was a little more difficult to use. It was harder to get up and running. And so the free was often countered by, well, yeah, it, it was free in cost, but it's eating up all of my time and that has a cost too. Increasingly, that's not been the case. Now, this is a bit of a dated screenshot. The, the software we use has matured past this, but this particular point in time, it, it, you can see this sort of image on the right, uh, raster analysis using actually um, not QGIS, which is the software I'm using here, but software called GRASS. And as we begin to see these incorporated uh, together, I could, I could increasingly access tools from other software programs all within this one interface. And that to me was from a teaching perspective in an introductory class, that was a game changer. I could do sophisticated and robust analyses but not have to teach four different software programs. So it became increasingly easy for uh, everyone uh, to use. Another E here and uh, is expanding beyond classroom walls. And this is one that actually had more of an impact than I anticipated in that before we had to have the, the software on desktop computers in a single lab. We were not allowed to hand out disks and say, hey, load this on your laptop, or hey, let's put let's put a couple of computers in the library and let's run it over there. Couldn't do that. But with open source software, of course, you can. You can have as many copies running uh, as you'd like. And so suddenly we were able to sort of release GIS from the lab environment into the full college environment. We had students in classrooms uh, working on GIS. We had students in the library. I had a student uh, catch me in the cafeteria with a map on his screen that, that he was working on and had questions. And I thought this is great. And it's also great because students can work at 2 a.m. in their dorm rooms, which is when they seem to prefer to do their homework. Uh, and so it really expanded our abilities to, to use the software as we saw fit. Another E is extensibility. And a thing I like about the tools that we tend to use in our classes is that you can always find an add-on or if you have the skills, you can build an add-on. You don't have to rely on the software that comes out of the box, right? Um, and so if you look at QGIS, for example, there are things called plugins, which you can go download. If there's something that you're really trying to do and you can't find a way to do it using the core software, there might be a tool out there that allows you to do it. Or again, if you have the skill set, you can even make your own. We also use the R statistical programming language and in R, there are packages, kind of the same general idea that you can grab a package, download it for your specific task. I tried to fit the packages that start with the prefix geo on the screen and I couldn't do it, right? There's, there's, these aren't all maybe geographic in nature, um, but there are many, many packages in for the R statistical programming language that allow you to do sophisticated uh, GIS as well. So you can find the packages that, that meet your needs. And then I guess in all, the, the final E and maybe the, the most important, important one would be employment, right? That we can find ways to give uh, students skills, meaningful skills for meaningful careers. And some folks were saying, well, that's why you should teach the proprietary software because that's probably what these people are gonna encounter in the working world. And my 
counter to that was to say, as long as we teach the fundamental concepts and vocabulary, I think students can move from one platform to another. That's my goal is to not train you to be platform specific, but to have the ability to move across multiple platforms. And indeed, one of our students went to work for the city of Asheville uh, and, and one of the, the folks there, Scott Barnwell, was, told me that we actually seek out people who have open source experience because we found that, that they tend to be um, more nimble. The, they're almost like GIS ninjas, they would say, because they can kind of figure out how to solve problems, not worry about which buttons to push in the, in the software. So that's kind of why we transitioned to open source. And that's been shoo, over probably 10, 12 years ago that we did that. And so I found that students really seemed to enjoy it. I felt like the learning objectives were not diminished. And if, if anything, I felt like we maybe enhanced student learning by tr transitioning to open source. Um, and so it got me thinking, um, you know, how, how else can we sort of move down this road of open? Because I started feeling a little sort of guilty um, or hypocritical because here I was, espousing the, the benefits of open source software and then turning around and asking students to buy an expensive textbook. And if you, it, this was something that um, I'm sure many people at this conference, if not everyone knows, is that textbook expense is not an insignificant issue. And the price of textbooks has not abated and it has become really a, a, an equity issue for many students. Uh, the, the cost of textbooks alone can be detrimental to student learning. In addition to the price, I was looking at the different books I tried over the course of several years, and students told me, um, well, first of all, it's expensive, but some people, this was, this was their words, this was a student valuation, this is it's too hand-holdy. It's, it's kind of like a, a recipe book. It tells me what to point and what to click, but it doesn't teach me to, it doesn't ask me to think, right? And so that obviously is, is not ideal. And so I then shifted, changed books to one that didn't talk about software at all, really. It just talked about sort of the underlying um, science uh, of geographic information science. And then the students balked and said, well, wait a minute, this is almost too theoretical. I like to have some kind of uh, hands-on <laughs> um, coverage in this, this book. I, I, I'm not getting what I need still. So I couldn't find a, a book that, met, that sort of bridged that gap um, correctly for me. Not to mention that that software changes, tools change, and therefore the, the book model is a little too slow to keep up with uh, the, the software and, and the tools that are that are being uh, updated and, and created each year. And also, again, a single book sometimes covered certain things I wanted to teach really well. Sometimes it covered things in a manner I thought was a little too difficult, perhaps or maybe it didn't even touch on a topic that I found for my classes was, was super important. So all of these reasons, I felt like, okay, I, I have to look beyond the textbook. This is not, not working. So several students just told me outright, I'm not buying it. I'll, I'll, I'll photocopy my friend's book or something to that, to that effect. So problematic to say the least. And so that's when I turned to looking at open educational resources. Um, again, the, the, the folks in this, uh, conference know these definitions all too well, I suspect, but to me, it's really sort of extending that philosophy of open source and applying it to uh, open, edu open educational resources. So the texts, the, the tutorials, the any materials that we wanted to use to learn, I began turning to open educational resources. And, and about that same time, I started to see that initiative uh, appear at, at multiple places in, in higher ed, one of which was NC Live, sort of library consortium. Um, they had an open education project and they actually uh, enticed faculty to make a switch to an open uh, educational resource uh, in, in, in a course. And they gave you some guidance on how to go about that. And so that's when I learned about the many repositories out there. Um, I won't list them here, but there, uh, one example would be an open textbook library here. Um, and this is actually a text I, I decided to, to use, um, Essentials of Geographic Information Systems. If you can see the, the very gray print down there, you might notice that the publication date was 2011. But I actually found like th this book will not be out of date because it's not it's talking about specific software. It is talking about geographic information science, the core concepts, the core vocabulary. And I thought that it did a really good job of doing that. 
And because it's open, uh, it's, it's free and open source, basically, I can use this text. I don't have to assign all of it. I don't have to feel guilty because students spend a lot of money on it. I can pick and choose which chapters I like, and I can bring in other supplemental material to cover the things that I don't feel are covered well here, and also some software-specific tutorials and tools. So I, by moving into this open educational resource, I think it really opened up our access to all kinds of, of teaching and learning materials that otherwise um, we would not have been able to, to use. And then thirdly, uh, after sort of switching the software, switching the textbook, I began looking at uh, open data. And uh, again, open data, uh, as, as I'm sure again, you know, uh, data that can be freely used, shared and built on by anyone. And again, adopting the principles of open source software. And so what that meant for me is that I was able to turn to tutorials or data sets um, that for, for free on the internet, that I could then incorporate into class. And that was important because uh, some people I think are afraid of not having a textbook that has a shiny wrapped up DVD full of data ready to go. Um, and uh, people told me like, you're gonna have trouble. You have to clean the data. You're gonna have issues out there. All of which I think are good learning uh, uh, points of, of a course, but there are so many data sets out there that are free and open that I didn't feel the need to make my students buy an overly priced DVD full of packaged tutorial data. And again, about a, a decade ago, we started to see this movement really take off. Uh, in my community in Asheville, uh, the city got behind open data, actually sponsored an open data day and, a, and sponsored a civic day of hacking. And so we saw this push to sort of take what had previously been either buried in PDFs or CDs um, into a, an open data portal online that we could could then use. So the city of Asheville created an open data portal. Cities across the country were doing this. Asheville certainly was not the first, but it's effective that you can go onto the site and easily uh, access multiple data layers uh, of all kinds for the city. At the state level, we saw the consolidation of, of many, many organizations and many, many compartmentalized GIS op GIS operations into NC One Map, where I can get anything from parcel data, um, I can get aerial imagery, all sorts of data increasingly available through this site. And at the national level, of course, there's data.gov. So, so again, we're, we're accessing more data than we could ever need <laughs> uh, on these different portals. And then students really seem to like poking around and seeing what they can find to incorporate into their projects. And OSGEO, of course, coming back to the OSGEO Foundation, provides uh, a lot of resources, um, tutorials, uh, video guides, things to help um, students and, and uh, teachers, for that matter, learn about the, the possibilities of, of open source software. And the final step, and this is one that is certainly not complete by any stretch of the imagination, but where I'm trying to go with it is to move towards something called open pedagogy. And open pedagogy, I think, means maybe different things to different people. But to me, it, it, it's, a, it's essentially trying to move away from the, the educational model that says, OK, we're going to put information into your head and you're going to spit it back out on a test. I'll grade it and we're done. Right. So it's, it's really a move away from what has been dubbed sort of the, the disposable assignment and move towards something that, that actually has real value and has value beyond just the professor teaching the class. And so uh and and thirdly sort of focusing less on the letter grade and more on true knowledge creation and helping these students um, learn the skills the concepts the, uh, the theories the ideas and then be able to apply them to their own problems that they run across so again this is early days for me but what i'm what i've done to try to move down this path is one i have i've added a an assignment for students that's essentially build a tutorial for the, for the students who come after you. So students in my spring semester of GIS were asked to pick something that we've already had already done in class and write up a four page tutorial um, to address. I, I gave them specifics about be sure to share the vocabulary, walk through with screenshots, uh, tell us what's the goal of using this particular set of tools and what kind of results might you expect. And so the students got into this because they knew, oh wow, I'm actually creating something that will be used by other people next semester. It's not being thrown away. 
Um, I also had students very early on in the course write a short paper on what I called sort of a critical GIS uh, assignment. So they were to go out and look for examples um, of GIS being used in the world for either good or or maybe in a way that needed to be more critically examined. So looking at things like gerrymandering or redlining uh, or, or different ways in which spatial data and software could be used to, um, again, restrict social justice or perhaps more hopefully promote social justice. So thinking again about not just the technology that we're learning in class, but how these technologies have an impact on the world around them. Uh, and I'm also having students, as much as I can possibly do, take on projects that are for not just me, but for an outside quote unquote client, right? And that might be their work crew. We've had students map storm drains or lighting fixtures for campus crews. We've had students do mapping projects for outside non-governmental organizations. But importantly, there's a set of eyeballs out there that are not my own. Uh, and it, it reminds students that there is a real world value to what they're doing. And I guess to, to wrap up, I would say that, that in terms of sort of takeaways and next steps for us, um, I, feel, I feel excited that we've kind of, I feel a critical mass around open source software, at least. We have uh, people in conservation biology, ecology, GIS, statistics courses, all using the R statistical programming language. Um, I, I feel like we've had this sort of beyond just GIS, a move institutionally towards open source. And we have been able to springboard from that and create a new minor in data science and just got approved uh, a, a new major uh, in data science. And so we're really trying to, to ramp up our, our focus here on data science, spatial data science, but focus almost exclusively on open source and open educational resources. And I also think that the switch has helped lead um, into some st student success, whether it be graduate school uh, or whether it be career-wise. We've had students trained on open source using open educational resources going into things like um, an applied math master's program or working for a data science startup or geospatial analytics PhD program or working for cities in their GIS uh, departments. I, I, I feel like, again, it's, it's maybe still anecdotal at this point because we're still sort of evolving, but I feel like we've been able to have some success by moving this way. And one I'll just quickly share to wrap, to wrap up, um, NASA has a program called NASA Develop, and it's basically a 10-week internship program, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's there for st students at the undergraduate level, graduate level, I think maybe even occasionally high school, but they get to work with a senior climate scientist on a real project for a real client and they have a real deliverable. And so two of our students went to work on this particular one, which is to develop a snowmelt monitoring tool using satellite data uh, in Alaska. And our students found this to be an amazing experience. Again, they got to work with a senior climate scientist. They knew they had a deliverable out there. It was not a disposable assignment. And they were able to, to not only survive this 10 week experience, but thrive. One of our students became the team leader. And they learned, they turned back on their sort of open source uh, experiences as sort of contributing to their ability to tackle this sort of um, very uh, detailed and large scale project. And so I, again, it's early days for us, I, I would say, but in my experience, um, transitioning to open source, open educational resources and open data and eventually open pedagogy have made us all better teachers and learners. So thank you so much. I'll stop there um, and have a great rest of your conference.